and we're back for session four as we continue looking at when God unravels your world and how he did so in the life of Nehemiah. We looked at it last time and we want to continue looking at his life and how he prayed in this session. Uh, it's in verses one through five or chapters one through five. We learned last time how Nehemiah prayed when he was broken and dependent on God. But then in this session, we're going to focus on how to pray when you experience resistance. It's remarkable when you're obedient to the Father, you expect everyone else to fall in line. And that doesn't always happen. We'll also learn uh, how to pray, what to pray, when God surfaces shared sin. And he will do that among followers. He did that in Nehemiah's life and among the people of God in the Old Testament. And also, what to pray in order to stay focused on God's grace, particularly uh, when people misunderstand your motives in following the Father and obeying what he's put on your heart. All these things are important because all of these things will unravel your world. Therefore, you pray. As we do in Nehemiah's life. So let's get a summary of Nehemiah's life up to where we'll be today. In Nehemiah chapter 1, we learned that Nehemiah is broken over his own sin and the sin of Judah. It's a powerful prayer in Nehemiah chapter 1. In chapter 2, is three months later, and he is still broken over Judah's condition. And Artaxerxes asks, what do you want me to do about it? And it says Nehemiah briefly prays. We don't know what he prays, but he's still in Artaxerxes' presence and then begins to ask. Will you send me and resource me? And the father does. In Nehemiah chapter 3, he's already there in Jerusalem, and he's beginning to organize the people for the work that the father had thrown his heart to do. It's a beautiful study of leadership and strategy. But now we get to chapter 4, and you find Nehemiah praying again because he and the people are experiencing resistance to what they're doing. So we find this in Nehemiah chapter four, verses one through three. Now when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged and he jeered at the Jews. He said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn the ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So when God unravels your world, how do you pray when you experience unexpected resistance? And that's literally what this is. It's unexpected, and here's why. Sanballat, who seems to be the chief cheerleader for this resistance, has two sons of his own with Hebrew names, daughter of his own, married the grandson of a high priest. You would expect there would at least be sympathy or a tenderness to the plight of the Jewish people, but there wasn't. Tobai himself was the head of a family who returned from Babylon he was also the Jewish Ammonite governor, Jewish Ammonite. I, I know that he would have a, a conflict of interest, and yet still there should be a tenderness in him toward the Jewish people because he has a relative in the priesthood, and, and even the storeroom there at the temple had been given him to use for his own personal items. But even though you can expect folks to be sympathetic when it comes down to how it affects their world, sometimes they will push back. And that unexpected pushback unravels your world. It's happened before in the movements of God. In the first great awakening, as the spirit of God began to pour out and you begin to see followers renewed and revived and their walk with Christ enlivened, you had a division within the body of Christ, particularly in America. They were called old lights, and new lights. Those who had experienced the outpour of God's spirit and a sense of renewal in their relationship with him were the new lights. The old lights were those who resisted and pushed back hard. How hard? 
Well, that's the reason that John Wesley and George Whitfield could not preach in many of the churches. They had to take the gospel to the fields and preach in open air fields because churches of the old lights shut their doors to them. Uh, furthermore, in the Reformation, uh, for Luther, he was asked to meet with uh, officials of the Roman Catholic Church at a particular site, but he was protected in Worms, and so in Germany, the Roman Catholic officials came to be with him and to grill him there, where he would not recant his firm conviction that salvation is by faith alone. As a result, if he had been outside of Worms, he would have been executed. I'm saying a lot to say. When the Father burdens you for what he desires, burdens you for what's on his heart to do, it will unravel your world when those who should know better resist and push back, which then should lead to prayer. That's the reason I love this statement by Martin Luther. At some point in the midst of the Reformation, he said this, I have so much to do today. I need to spend at least two hours in prayer. That's completely counter to my way of thinking. I would say, you know, I've got so much to do today. I better reduce my prayer time. No, it's because he knows the necessity of being in the Father's presence when everything around him and within him seems to be unraveled. He needs his security in the Father, so he needs to spend more time in prayer. And so how does he pray when this resistance comes? Again, we're back in Nehemiah chapter 4. Look at verses 4 and 5. He prays, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Powerful, strong, direct. And here's what he does. In prayer, Nehemiah gives them to God. Father, you deal justly with them. But also, I, I would add to this out of my own experience. Remember the grace that God gives you. I, I've been in experiences before where leading and uh, pressing on with what the Father put on my heart to do and found individuals I didn't expect to resist, resist hard. And in those moments of prayer, it was the Father who revealed to me, in my mind, at least he brought to mind, Romans chapter 5, 8, that while uh, Christ was on the cross loving me, dying for me, I was the one wounding him, resisting him, sinning against him. It gave me a picture of his grace given to me. So yes, I can turn them over to the Father and say, Lord, deal justly with them but also do so with grace in my heart for what he's had to do to offer grace to me. In the midst of all that, as you pray, you keep doing what God asks. And Nehemiah does, as does the people. It's a great time right now just to stop and pray. Take some of this information that you've received and, and begin to process it through prayer. And here are some things to pray that might help you process it. The first is this. Father, help me overcome my wrong expectations. Those who don't understand the gospel will likely be offended and resistant to it. So, Father, I'm going to be overwhelmed. I'm going to be hurt by wrong expectations. But, Father, I pray that you will help me understand. For the lost, they will be offended and resistant. It should be expected. Father, give me your wisdom in detecting and responding to their resistance, even when it's ugly. Help me respond, Father, the way you want me to in those moments. And Father, remind me of the way Jesus loved me when I was ugly to him in my resistance to him. It's a great balancer in our prayer. So take time to pray through this. When you're finished, push on pause and we'll move forward. All right, when God unravels your world, pray in those moments that God surfaces shared sin, because candidly, when he does, it 
unravels your world and the world of others around you as he begins to break them and reveal their sin that is shared among you. Uh, you'll find this in Nehemiah chapter one, verse uh, chapter five, verses one through five. It's while rebuilding the walls that God reveals some of the sin that led to this condition the people are in. Here it is in verse one. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said that we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there are those who said we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. Wow, here's the backstory. There has been a hard famine. As a result, the ground has been uncultivated for decades. And now in this famine, they're having a hard time producing a crop. The heavy taxes on them make it even more challenging to purchase grain. So what are they doing? They're borrowing money to buy grain. Now, what's sad is their own kinsmen are charging interest for the loans that they are, are securing to get the grain. But even with that's not enough, uh, some are even selling their children as slaves to get money to buy grain so they can live. Now, when you see all of this in light of Exodus chapter 22, verse 25, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 19, and chapter 24, verse 18, God has already told his people long ago to do this is a sin. To charge interest to your own kinsmen is a sin. To take your own kinsmen's children as slaves and to sell your children as slaves to your kinsmen is a sin. And through all of this work of trying to restore the walls and the people's lives of Jerusalem, this long sin has surfaced. So what do they do? They confront it and repent. You find this in Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Then they said, after Nehemiah confronted them over it, we will restore these and require nothing of them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them swear to do as they had promised. I also shook out the fold of my garment and said, so may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep this promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they promised. There was a confronting of the sin. There was a repenting of the sin. And then there was a praising of the Father for his goodness. Uh, I experienced something similar years ago, pastoring a church in Oklahoma. I hosted something called men praying for awakening. We spent a Saturday morning, invited men from different surrounding churches to come in and hear about movements of God and prayer, and then just to stop and pray. What was remarkable as we began to see what the Father had done in history and the scripture, men began to confess shared sin, the common sin of pornography. We even had pastors present who were confessing sin of being jealous of other pastors in the region. It was a powerful moment, a powerful moment that moved and bridged over to the next Sunday, not just in the church I serve, but in surrounding churches who had attended uh, the prayer time. But I can talk about the church I serve. That Sunday night, 
I asked a young man to share his story of salvation. I had the joy of watching the father draw him for weeks and was there as the father beautifully adopted him. So he shared his story of salvation. And then I just opened it up to others who wanted to share. I had a, a deacon who simply confessed, you know, I, I really haven't given to the church for years because I've lost my joy in giving. Another man stood up and said, I know I should be the spiritual leader of my home, but I am not. And I ask my family's forgiveness. Another brother who had been there that uh, Saturday said there was a gentleman that the father prompted me to have a gospel conversation with, and I just avoided him. I was too busy, and I knew he had told me to go talk to him, and I didn't. And he said to the church, I ask your forgiveness, but mainly I ask the father's forgiveness for not obeying his prompting. What stirred me up too is people began to embrace each other that night. I, I knew of a family uh, who was having a hard time with their adolescent daughter. And I watched them embrace as they confessed to each other how they had handled it wrongly and praised the father for bringing them back together. It's remarkable what the father does when he confronts us with our shared sin and we repent because it naturally leads to praise. The Welsh Revival of 1904, I may have mentioned it in a previous session. Prior to that revival, the statement was the pubs are full and the churches are empty. But once the Spirit of God began to move and transformation took place in Wales, the constables were out of work. And so their main job were being quartets at the revivals. Uh, a man from London was sent by his paper to report on what was happening in Wales. And he simply reported back for his column. He said, you can tell the revival is coming when you hear the singing. It's the kindness of God to surface our sin and also give us the privilege to be confronted that we might repent and in the repenting, sing. So we'll use this time right now just to stop and pray. Here's some prompters again. Father, keep me humble. Remind me that when you surface my sin, it's because you love me. And Father, humble me so that my confession is more than I'm sorry. It's truly repentance. And Father, as David prayed, return to me the joy of my salvation. Let me sing again knowing I'm forgiven and clean before you. This should be a sweet time of prayer. Take your time with it. When you're finished, push unpause, come back, and I have a little bit more. And finally, when God unravels your world, there are times you need to pray to stay focused on God's grace. That's what's happening to Nehemiah. You would think after this wonderful sense of renewal and revival among the people that everything would stay well and sweet for years. But in a matter of days, they're already questioning Nehemiah's motives for being there. Nehemiah's uh, wanting to be governor, they say. They want, he wants to be in charge. That's the reason he's doing this for his own selfish ambitions. In Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 9, Nehemiah turns his face toward heaven and says, Remember me with favor, O my God, for all I have done for these people. That's his motivation. It is a powerful verse because the Hebrew word for favor can also be translated as grace. It's remarkable. Uh, the Old Testament word for favor, when translated in New Testament Greek, can be translated with the same Greek word for grace. So he said, Father, remember me with your grace. Also, pray that you will not only experience God's grace, but that others will see it too. Even when your world is unraveled and you're disappointed by what people may be saying. Uh, this was the beautiful picture in the movement of God in China in 1905. I mentioned this in the last session, but it's Jonathan Goforth in his book, uh, on that great movement of God. He describes it this way. He said, in that movement, whole towns heard of the confessions 
And this was confessions taking place in churches. And you have to realize that the Chinese culture is one of save face. Everything you have to do is to protect your image in front of others. And yet people were crying and weeping, confessing their sins to each other and before the father. Furthermore, people in the community could see the transformation as abusive husbands were now loving their wives. Those which were known for being abusive were now respecting, revering caring for loving their wives. Also, businessmen in the cities who had cheated others were now asking them for forgiveness and were actually repaying what they had taken. In one particular community, as this transformation was evident, as this grace of God was visible to the people of the city, the people began to say, a new Jesus had come. Now, it's not as if this is a different Jesus. They had seen an outpouring of God's spirit on these believers eight years earlier and saw the transformation in their life, this grace being seen. So they're saying Jesus has returned. A new Jesus. Jesus is back. You could see him in the lives of the followers, which surely should prompt our prayers. So one last prayer session. Father, let my sole motivation in obeying you be that your grace is seen. Or, or Father, may you be glorified by the comments of others as they see evidence of your grace in us, your bride. Or, or Father, grant us the joy and privilege of pointing to you when anyone asks us for the reason behind our actions, it's all about you, your grace. So take time, pray this through, make it your own. The Father may even take you into a direction of prayer you hadn't planned, just let him take you. When you're finished, push on pause and let me just wrap up with something. I just want to wrap up that this has been our study of Nehemiah when God unraveled his world and seeing his prayer life. I really want us to see that there are more individuals in scripture that experience this unraveling of God, either through the circumstances of their life or through what the father reveals as he makes himself known to them. So next time we're going to look at when God unraveled Simon Peter's world and how he prayed. So we'll look at it next time. I'll see you then.